Am I coming out of the mains? Hello? Good morning, oh. good morning. Hi, Paige. Good to see you all here. Thank you, everybody who uh, was here cleaning yesterday. There was windows being cleaned and bathrooms and kitchens and floors and gravel was put down. Really appreciate all the work that went into that. Um, and yeah, it looks really good. Let's stand together. We'll sing our first song. Good morning. Good morning. So I said we would have a pollock outside because it would not rain. It's not going to rain, but people want to have it inside. So we'll have it inside. But it's not going to rain, though. <laughs> um, thank you again, like Ben said, all the people that came out yesterday. The basement smells a lot better. <laughs> the windows are washed. The floors are washed. Um, thank you, all the people working the, out in the fence line and the gravel and the play structure. Thank you. Um, announcements. Next Sunday, church starts at 9.30 a.m. Okay? Next Sunday, 9.30 a.m. for the summer schedule. No Sunday school class, church, and then get together with families afterward if you'd like to. Um, and also our next potluck, we will be having a, um, on the 20th, I think it's 21st, for the Father's Day. We will have a congregational meeting after this service. We'll have the meeting and then we'll have the potluck, okay? So your day will not be any longer than it is today. Um, and then also too, you probably received email this week from camp. Um, Chris is looking for cooks for different areas of camp during the summer or any other thing you want to be involved in, please respond to her if you're available. Any other announcements? Okay, thank you. Good morning. We'll just kind of, hopefully the kids filter out nicely. Uh, this is a, not an a announcement to cause anybody any concern, but the elders have been kind enough to agree to allow me to take a, what I consider kind of a short-term sabbatical, probably about six months, uh, to just have a break from 
the kind of the day-to-day -day efforts of being an elder, and I'm hoping to focus a little bit more on some uh, prayer and study uh, so that I can focus on what God wants from my life as an elder so I can be a more effective elder. So just to put at anybody's minds at ease, nothing's wrong. I'm just uh, feeling a little tired after a few years of eldering. So they've agreed to let me take a short break and hopefully when I return, I will, uh, I'm not going anywhere. I'll still be helping with speaking, but when I return to the task of eldering, I'll be more effective for God. Thank you. Super. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, I, yeah. Uh, some of you know this has been a really busy week uh, for our family. Um, just some things at work, wrapping up the school year, things like things get more busy and, and stuff. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm really encouraged to, to bring the word this morning. Um, one thing in my prayer life, I've been asking for boldness to to give glory to the Lord. Um, so, yeah, I pray that, that God would be honored in our time together this morning as we look at his word, um, that you would be able to see through me and see what God is saying. Um, as we look at Genesis 17, we've been in Genesis for a while. Um, uh, we followed, kind of, we started in the beginning. We, start, we talked about the creation of the world, of humanity. We follow the, the family lines of Cain and Seth until they lead to Noah. Um, and, and where God sees a wickedness in, in the earth and he it says he regrets and he cleanses the earth through the flood but spares Noah's family. Um, we looked at God giving us the grace of a limited lifespan and uh, confusing our language um, so that we would be um, more humble and, and less likely to, to come together in, 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 in rebellion against him. And then lately, we've been talking a lot about this family, of, and in, this starts in Genesis 11, but Abram's family and God's commitment to a specific people he's made. Um, there have been lots of themes so far as we've looked together. We talked about the theme of, of waters and chaos, of, of traveling east away from God. Um, there have been repeated names, uh, a comp which kind of symbolizes a, a competing legacy between the people of God and the people who want to do things their own way. Um, we've looked at the theme of, of, of people making good and evil in their own image, of the idea of cities and, and having a people um, to provide for you. So uh, that's just a, a basic review, um, but we've specifically looked at Abram's family and um, and as, as God has chosen one family to, to bring his covenant to all the families of the earth, so far this is kind of what we've seen. So in, in Genesis, uh, we start out with Abram leaving at the age of 70, the land of Haran, the land of his fathers. Um, he, uh, he builds an altar in Canaan. And then shortly thereafter, he ends up in Egypt where he and Sarah, well, Sarai marries Pharaoh. His wife marries another man, Pharaoh. And uh, God uh, orchestrates some um, pain in the household of Pharaoh to exile, to, to get Pharaoh to exile uh, Abram and Sarai. And so they return to this altar that they knew at first. And there, uh, Abram calls upon the name of the Lord. After that, uh, he separates from Lot's family. He hears God's promise and he builds another altar and he moves to Hebron. Um, God makes a covenant with Abram, and he promises him descendants. Um, this is after the call. And then we, last week, we looked at how Abram and Sarai, they, they, take, um, they make this plan to take Hagar and to try to, find, try, try to complete God's promise for him. By this time, Abram is now 86 years old, and Ishmael's born. This morning, we'll look at the story of of, of Abram and Sarai's renaming and of the promised birth of Isaac. And by now, Abram is now 99. So the story so far has followed almost, uh, what's that, like 30 years of his life. Um, and uh, if you're looking forward in, your, in, your, in the scriptures, 
um, you'll see that you know it continues on in the next part in the story, and we'll cover this next, is that where Abram meets with God and God reveals the destruction of Sodom. But if we look at Abram's life so far, he's had two pretty colossal failures in his life. What went down in Egypt and what happened with Hagar. And this happened really as a result of him not seeking the Lord. For someone who is so often mentioned as seeking the Lord, in these two instances, there's not a mention of him building an altar, calling upon the name of the Lord. These are decisions he's kind of made in his own earthly wisdom. When he seeks the Lord, he shines an example of all the positive things we think of when we think of what a patriarch could really be. But when he fails, he really embodies all the negative things of when we think of what patriarchal or patriarchal sort of authority might look like. So this morning we'll, answer, we'll ask some questions and hopefully we'll answer these questions. Perhaps you'll kind of think about these as we, as we conclude. But I want to ask the Lord to come in our time and, and to teach us from his own word as we seek him together. Father, we're thankful for your presence, that not only are you a God who is present with Abram and Isaac and Jacob and the one who did miracles and who came in the form of Jesus and set us free from our sins, but you're a God who inhabits your people today. And so we are your people and we're gathered here to bring glory to you. Um, we're gathered here to grow close to you and we know that you are our inheritance and so this morning, as we humbly look at your word, we pray that you would speak your words of truth into our lives, that we would be changed, that you would grow us closer to you, that you deliver us from the sin we don't even know we're involved in sometimes, and that you would use us to bless others and deliver others from the sin which would enslave them. Help us to see truly and to hear truly what your word has to say. And I pray that your spirit would speak through me this morning as we look at these questions. Amen. So my goal this morning is that we would look past Abraham to ourselves. That we would look at the story of Abraham, but not just see it as history or as something we've heard before, because I undoubtedly you've heard this before but that we would connect it to our own experience. So four questions came to mind when I looked at chapter 17 of Genesis, and they were these. How does this event, this event with Abraham and Isaac and the naming, connect to our own salvation? This, uh, this passage mentions the, the, this is the first place to mention circumcision. So the question that came to mind is, is how is circumcision relevant to us who aren't Jews? And then what does God's love for and pursuit of Hagar, Sarah, and Abraham tell us about his love for and pursuit of us? And how can their relationship with God give us hope for our own? There's really four sections we'll read this morning, um, and we'll break it up, but uh, let's read this first section. It says, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face. And God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations." I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your offspring after you. And I will give you and your offspring, excuse me, and to your offspring after you, the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God." Fourteen years after Abram took Hagar as a wife, God again pursues Abram. Whereas before, we might be able to say that Abram was being rewarded with a promise for his faithfulness with the king of Sodom and giving back the wealth to the king of Sodom or maybe giving the 10% to Melchizedek. This is much removed from his history. God is clearly the initiator in this scene. He pursues Abram. 
There's a parallel here between our own salvation. When in, Abr in God's pursuit of Abram, Abram is given a new name. This is seen again with Jacob, who becomes Israel. And it's seen in the New Testament, where Jesus renames or names Peter, and, and, and Saul is renamed to Paul. This giving a name as an adult, this new name, uh, signifies a rebirth. If there's any scene where we could say, this is where Abraham gets saved, it, it might be this one. His salvation experience maybe might not be as dramatic as, as someone like Zacchaeus or, or the Philippian jailer of the New Testament or, or the man born blind. They see this appearance of Christ or of one of Christ's followers and they, they cast all their and they come to this, you know, this, this moment in time where they repent. But it might be a little bit more like, you know, the centurion Cornelius who, who gradually comes to faith or... Some of us might identify with, with some of those. Our stories might be one where we came to faith sort of gradually over time. But God pursues both. God is the one to establish the covenant with these, not, not them. This is not Abraham seeking God and gone finally, you know, he found, here I am, I found, this is hide and go seek. But Abraham is, is called to be a part of the covenant. He's called to be blameless and to walk before God. We, too, are called to be a part of God's new covenant established under Jesus. How does this event connect to our own salvation? It mirrors our own. Abraham's story, our story, is a story of naming, a story of calling. The truth of Scripture is not that just it's a historical record, but that it tells us something of ourselves. Out of the prophet Isaiah, it says, "...the nation shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory." And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called my delight is in her and you shall in your land married for the Lord delights in you. As Christians, we are called to honor the name because we are called by the name. Just as Christians in the town of Antioch were first called Christians or little Christs, we too are called by Christ. Therefore, just as Abraham was called to walk before the Lord and be blameless, so too we are called to walk before the one who has called us to be like him, because we have been called by him and because we have been called in him and of him. For some, this call may seem more dramatic, for others more subtle, but for all, there is a power and a truth to that call, that the God of the heavens has called us and pursued us. So this passage speaks of, of salvation. There's a parallel for us in salvation, but, but what further does this say? And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. God gives Abraham a personal, very personal sign of the new covenant. He is bringing this into the world, in the for, this sign in the form of, of circumcision. Abraham and his people are to participate in circumcision as a sign of their faith in the covenant. We might practice circumcision today with different cultural baggage than Abraham likely understood it. We may not under, understand the, the fullness of the symbolism behind circumcision, but we do know some of the basics. There is, to Abraham, and, and definitely to us, hopefully, there's, there's little more valuable than human life. It's interesting to me that, that God makes Abraham a blessing, but he gives him a sign to remember the covenant that is intimately tied to that blessing. The sign was really important, enough so that it became cause for cutoff from the people of God. This is a sign that would endure when Paul, thousands of years later, would decide to go on a journey and minister to some Jewish um, peoples, he took a man who was faithful to the scriptures, 
But because he was going to minister to descendants of Abraham, he had, he had this man circumcised so that the Jews he hoped to convince of the gospel wouldn't be offended by this man. This man's name was Timothy, and you can read about it in Acts chapter 16. Baptism today is too a sign of inward change. It's an important one. It, too, has value and power because of the inward change that takes place. For early Christians, baptism was the sign of the covenant and new life, just as new Jews, or Jews who were born on the eighth day, right, were circumcised before they had did, done much uh, in, terms, in terms of obeying the covenant. New Christians were baptized in the day of their profession of belief. I made a little Venn diagram here so you could see kind of some differences between circumcision and, and New Testament baptism. There are some differences. Circumcision obviously was, was done only for boys. Um, women were not circumcised according to Old Testament law. Uh, baptism was done for both men and women. Um, circumcision was mostly done to infants, though they're like in the example of Timothy, there were some examples of, of men who, who converted to Judaism who were, who were um, uh, who were circumcised later. Uh, baptism in the New Testament was mostly done to adults, though there's some question of when whole, how whole households were, uh, whole households were, were baptized. Um, circumcision is tied to the promise of new physical life. You guys know how babies are made, okay? Um, it's interesting that the sign is done on, on, on the guy's parts, right? Just as he would have thought, I mean, Abraham might have thought, am I the one, am I sterile? What, what's going on here? Um, of course, he did have Ishmael at this point, but he would have maybe remembered that uh, when, when he and Sarah lay together and when they think of trying to conceive, this sign of his hope in God's promise. Um, we, we identify not with a, a physical life, but with of a new spiritual life. Um, and, and, and another difference is that, that we identify with Christ's death in that baptism. Um, there's not a, an image of death in circumcision. But there's a lot of really, really strong similarities, too. Baptism and circumcision were both done for new converts, whether they were babies or, or adults who believed. This was something that was done to, to, to baby believers um, before they had done much. There wasn't any necessary pre-work for an eight-year-old or for an eight-day-old to be, to be circumcised. You didn't have to prove your Judaism. Similarly, Christians were baptized right after they were believed. Um, and, and in both, they were seen as signs that the inward reality was important. Peter talks about how baptism is, is an important symbol. And it's not the baptism that saves, not the water that saves, but the pledge of good conscience towards God. On the other hand, they're both commanded. They're both, we're both called to pull these things. If you're a Jew, you were to be circumcised. If you're a Christian, you're called to be baptized. Um, this is a, a, a powerful symbol and the start of a new covenant. And there's a parallel in this between, um, but between Matthew 28, this passage about circumcision, uh, be, between what Jesus says in, in, in Matthew 28, the, we, we call the Great Commission, right? So on the left, you see here the passage that we just read, um, Genesis, this portion of Genesis chapter 17. And then on the right, you see Matthew 28, where Jesus says, where, where it reads, uh, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus says to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You see real strong similarities here. The God appears to Abram and says, I am God Almighty. Jesus comes to the disciples and he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. God talks about a covenant between Abraham and his people. Jesus talks about going with them always to the end of the age. And both of these peoples are given a sign to obey. We are Jesus' disciples. We are called, just like Abram is called to walk in holiness, as disciples to make further disciples. And the sign of that discipleship is baptism. It has power not in us or how much we understand at that moment or what it is to follow Jesus, but in the God who backs up that covenantal promise. So Abraham is given a new name. He's brought into the covenant, given a sign of the covenant, and given work to do. Much like we, when we call upon Jesus for our salvation, are given a new name, his name, brought into the covenant, 
and given a sign of the covenant and given work to do. But the passage continues on. This isn't just about Abraham's covenant or one just for the men. Let's continue. And God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her. And moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God said, no, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son. And you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father 12 princes and I will make him into a great nation. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. Sarah and Hagar are both pursued by the Lord. In a culture where they had little to say and, and little to offer, God pursues them both. In the midst of much injustice, God pursues them both. He brings them liberty and blessing. Sarah, too, is given a new name, and she is given a child, or at this time, a promise of one. Hagar, who had been faithfully serving as a second-class wife ever since God told her to go back to Sarah, would be established and provided for by her son Ishmael, whom God promises to establish into a great nation of his own. She is not destined to servitude merely because she is not chosen to inherit the blessing. God promises blessing to her too, an identity even for those of a people of Ishmael who would not pursue him in the same way that Isaac's offspring would. So what is God's love for in pursuit of Hagar, Sarah, and Ishmael tell us about his love in pursuit of us? Self fought for freedom and ambition is, is really not painted in the best light in Genesis. Look at the characters who seek their freedom most. You see Lot, who seeks his freedom and, and advancement with, with ingratiating himself with the king of Sodom, or Lamech, who um, you know, beats people into submission. Those who are the most free in the worldly sense are the most slaves to their own sin. Those who wait on the Lord, by contrast, are blessed, blessed quietly over time. And they receive a blessing from the Lord that those outside can only dream of. You know, where I see this coming to a, a kind of a, a climax is, is when Abram and the king of Sodom meet. And, and Abram, you know, he, he meets with the king, he, he meets with this king and priest, Melchizedek. And they have this communion and he gives him this tenth of everything. And then the king of Sodom is like, oh yeah, you can keep all the good stuff. And he tries to like ingratiate him with these, these two people. And it's like, he totally misses the boat. And I just, I just imagine he's like, what's going on? Like, who are you? Why are you met? Why are you, no you know, it's like, and he just says, I, I'm not going to give, I'm not going to take any of your stuff. And, and, and Abram is, is operating on this like completely different level than the king of Sodom, who's trying to use wealth to weasel himself into Abram's blessing. And, and that's indicative of, of these who, who would wait on the Lord. Um, Hagar, in her obedient submission to God, returns to Sarai as a second-class wife, and, and she's rewarded with an assurance of reward that many of us would dream of. Not only is, is she blessed in that her son will provide for her, but she sees God. She knows that God sees her and hears her. I can think of many times in my life when I desired that, for God to show up and say, Matt, I see you. I hear you. And, 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 and Hagar, in her obedience, in her servitude, in her submission, is when she sees that. Sarah, too, likewise, in her obedience to Abram, I mean, she was abused, too. Um, and, and her faith in the Lord is rewarded, even though she has failures. And she is blessed by the Lord with this new, new name, that God has given her a name. Let me read to you out of Ephesians 4. Paul writes these words, Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would serve Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, 
knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. Paul and James both teach us that there are ways we who are free must become like a servant to all to follow after our Savior, Jesus, who did the same. By becoming a servant and dying in that way, we set ourselves free from other things that would seek to become our masters. Not only do we see this from Hagar and Sarah as they follow the Lord from a position of weakness, but we also see it from Paul as he gives up his prestige, or James and John who leave the family business to follow after Jesus, and the many women who gave sacrificially both during and after Jesus' ministry to support the work out of a love for the Lord. These people were convinced of the surety of their reward to the point where it focused their efforts. The psalmist writes, I lift up my eyes to the hills from where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. What sustains them? Is it not the God who does call us to seek him? Does he call us to seek him on our own? No. The Lord seeks us all. But he earnestly rewards those who return that seeking, right? As we draw near to the Lord, he draws near to us, whether we always sense it or not. He is faithful and seeks us regardless of any position or prestige we think we have. Let's finish the chapter by looking at how Abraham further responds. When he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Then Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all those born in his house or bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house. That was at least 318, right? And he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day, as God had said to him. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, and Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised, and all the men of his house, those born in the house and those bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. Abraham trusts God more than his own experience, even his experience of God. God had promised 30 years ago that Abraham would be a great nation and bless all the families of the earth. God hadn't met his promise yet. All that Abraham and Sarah have tried to do to get things done haven't worked, but they also haven't removed them from God's plan. On the one hand, this gives me some pause. Pause because I don't want to try to realize God's kingdom for him. I don't want to try to reason or trick my way through God's promise like Abram and Sarai did, trying to force God's plan through human means. I want to be careful what I attribute to to God's work in the world and, and how God is working. But it also gives me, and it should give us, great encouragement. God is not hindered by Abraham and Sarah's failings and so unable to use them to accomplish his purposes. And they aren't forever cast off because of their failings. But just after Abraham and likely Sarah and Hagar were involved in this whole circumcision thing, like someone had to cook and clean and do the work when these guys were laid up, right? Just as they obey and following through with circumcision, their camp is rewarded with God's own presence passing through. Look over to Genesis chapter 18, right? Three men appear, and God, God appears in these three men, and these three men pass through the camp of Abram, Abraham. To me, great, Abraham's greatest act of faith was continually coming back to the altar and seeking the Lord. We don't have to be perfect to be involved in God's plan or be used by God. God calls us to be holy, but he is gracious and pursues us. Abraham's act of obedience here in circumcising everyone immediately is a natural fruit of his walk with the Lord, a walk that is intimate and frequent. These constant trips back to the Lord have made Abraham and his family value the words of God, and so he does not delay to obey God's command, and the reward they receive is the very presence of God. How can their relationship with God give us hope for our own? Let me read to you a couple of passages, one out of John and one out of Luke. 
Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will be my servant also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. And out of Luke 8, As for that in the good soil, they are the ones who, bearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart, and bear fruit with patience. No one, after lighting a lamp, covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a stand so that those who may enter may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be known and come to light. Take care, then, how you hear. For to the one who has, more will be given, and from the one who has not, even what he thinks he has, will be taken away. Today, church, is the day of salvation. Just as sins can compound to ruin a life, so yielded righteousness can combine to bear exceeding fruit. We're not called to shoot up quickly, bear fruit, and wither, but like the good seed in the parable, to bear fruit with patience, to consider carefully how we hear, to die to the cares and desires of this world as we draw closer to the Lord together. In doing so, we entrust ourselves to God who grows in us today despite our failures. I know that the women's Bible study has been studying lots of things. Lately, it's been the book of Acts, or I think that's right. Um, I wonder if there's a parallel between the obedience of Abraham and that of Acts in their patient endurance, but also their oneness of spirit. Would the Lord see that same pattern of obedience, prayer, intimacy, sincerity among us? We can't control the world just like Abraham's people can. We, 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 neither could the early church living in a hostile land. But the best thing we can do for the world is for us to seek the Lord from a sincere heart together this day and every day. To live out the reality of our baptism, our circumcision of the heart and to run with perseverance in the good works God has prepared for us to do. This morning, we've looked at God's work with Abraham and how it connects to our own walk with the Lord. I've spoken briefly, perhaps not too briefly. I can be long-winded sometimes, but with hope that we would see this account as more than just the history of Abraham, but also connect it to our own story. How we too are renamed of the Lord, And how we aren't just baptized to die to sin, but also to live to Jesus through his covenant to all from any nation who would seek him. And how even in our failings, God can use our faith. It is also true that God has already done great things in our body. I don't mean for this encouragement to make little of the fruit already born among us. Only to push us on so that we may be focused on the work that God has for us today tomorrow, and as long as his coming delays. But being a church doesn't mean that you come, you listen politely and participate in the worship time, go home refreshed so you can meet the challenges of the week. The church isn't run by the elder team or an extraordinarily gifted pastor who can give inspiration, vision, or wisdom when the people need it. It's so much more than that. One image of the church is that of a body where each part contributes and receives and where Christ himself is head. In Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, he he picks up on this image. He says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your column, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all of the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. One way lately we've been trying to practice this reality 
is in our once a month sharing times. Conscious that we are all members of the body, all gifted, we invite anyone who is a part of this body to share an encouragement that will build up the body of Christ towards maturity. Conscious, too, that we serve one spirit, and then he may speak through more than one of us, we encourage you to share briefly and to listen carefully to what the Lord may be saying. Or if the Lord has laid on your heart a song, then we might respond to it in worship, or a prayer, that we might share that as well. I'm going to close us in prayer, uh, and then we'll start our sharing time. When our time seems to have come to a close, one of the elders will come and invite us to take the Lord's Supper together. We'll have a couple of songs during that time, and you can come up and take the, take the elements, and we'll take communion. Afterward, of course, you're invited to stay for a brief lunch, and we'll, we'll spend some more time fellowshipping and encouraging one another. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father, it is true that you are our Lord and God, that you are our Savior and our Father, our Comforter, our Friend, our Healer, our Provider. You're the God who sees. You're the God who is near. You do not slumber or sleep. You dwell amongst your people. You reconcile us. Um, there are so many roles in our life that if we would just yield, you would, you would fill them and you would, you would be those things for us. And you know our, our faults, Lord. You know our weakness and our frame that we are dust. But we pray that you would use this dust to, to bless your name, that we may be found truly in you. Um, that like Abraham and Sarah, that we would live up to our new name, that your promise would go forth in us and it would just, it would just be a blessing to, to those around us, to those that some might see and be reconciled to you and that it would bring them life, that, that you would bring about your redemption through your people here. And this morning, as we, as we come to a time of sharing, Lord, would your spirit speak amongst us and um, would you fill us with gifts to, to share, to bless this body, inspire us with a vision as to what you're calling us to and draw us together in unity during this time as we worship you, we know that you truly are the, the greatest inheritance that, that we can ever hope to have, even if we lose track of that sometimes. And we pray that your grace would cover over those sins, that we would be forgiven for, for the sins that we have committed, both uh, purposefully, intentionally, Lord, and accidentally or unintentionally, and that you would cleanse us and restore in us a righteousness and holiness that would be worthy of your name. Thank you so much for the personal call that you have given us, Lord, that you love us deeply, that you are with us, and that you are our Father. We pray these things that your name might be made great and that your, your love would just go forth. Amen.